is me, this is Lindsay, this is Megan, this is Jolene. You'll meet them uh, if you're interested in following them or me or us or whatever. So, But if you want to, you could hashtag N10Learn, and then for those of you who know Twitter, it's nice to go back later tonight and be able to see the collection of what was tweeted. Um, so I do like to say hi. You know if we came to something like this, we'd have to say hello. Uh, and so if we – if you don't mind a little sort of ambush, I like – you know, if you give me your name and your and what you do and what organization you're with, uh, obviously this is huge opportunity to network with some folks. Uh, what's your hometown? Whatever you define your hometown as, and uh, perhaps a little known fact. So that could be whatever you want to define that as. Well, something uh, you know, don't be afraid to brag on yourself or something unique about yourself or yeah, we. Uh, I've had people say, oh, uh, you know, I've done this with folks. I like little known facts. I've done it with folks who all work together. And then someone will say, oh, and, you know, when I was in high school, I sang at the White House. And people are like, you? You know, <laughs> so it's a little bit uh, fun. So um, would you mind starting us off? I Not to – go ahead. See why, yeah. <laughs> no. Let me ask Lindsay, should I pass this microphone a, a, along as we do this so uh, we have some people? Do you guys mind? Okay. Uh, not a career, though? Right. Let me pass this to you. And I'm just going to jot that in my head while I'm thinking about that. <laughs> Feel free to come back to it. Um, my name is Jason Maka. I'm the Information Management Officer at the San Antonio Air foundation so I drove in from San Antonio uh, yeah all the way to be here with you guys this morning so um, I am pretty much from San Antonio and a little known fact uh, this is the first year I'm growing a beard so <laughs> I didn't I wasn't able to grow facial hair till I was 30 so and I'm 35 now <laughs> so we'll see how it goes I have until December 1st my wife's birthday to shave it off I think that's what she told me so <laughs> So no shave November, that's pretty good. Is it? Nope. Feels like at times. So, uh, major gift is is the word now <laughs> to accommodate that. So that's it. Echo Rise Youth Anniversary. It's really exciting. You saw the pictures that we do that often. We use more or less men and tune. I work here with Mike Michael and Tony Wood and Brian and Michael and I try to grow the country. So. broke the string of hair-related little-known facts, but uh, <laughs> All right, um, I'm Olivia Williams. I work here at Blackbaud. I work on merchant account setup for Illuminate Online. Uh, my hometown, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina, and a little-known fact, I was a dancer for 15 years. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kirby Gilliam. I am a enga an engagement manager for data management services here at Blackbaud. Uh, my hometown is Memphis, Tennessee, and um, I, I lived in Ireland for um, three months. Speaking 
of the spring, all the black lab folks here in the back row. I'm Rachel Jackson. I'm a client success manager here in the Austin office for Blackbaud. Uh, my hometown is Nashua, New Hampshire. And the little known fact is I have been on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which is a NPR radio show. Called in, try and get my car fixed. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dan Germain. I am vice president of business development for Small World Labs uh, here in Austin. Uh, I consider Austin to be my hometown these days. I've been here since uh, the early 80s. Uh, so I think that's probably, you know, almost a native. Um, a little note in fact, I'm also a race car driver. And uh, the, um, uh, how many of you have seen the movie Office Space, right? So Von Birch, Blue Porsche in that movie, that was my car that they used to film the movie. <laughs> so that's it right there, see? If you want to see it, there it is. a hard act to follow. Uh, my name is Ken Aponte. I'm also with Small World Labs. I'm the Director of Professional Services for the organization Community Solutions and Integration and, and Implementation of our products for our nonprofits. Ken Aponte, yeah. Uh, my hometown is Rochester, New York. Uh, it's getting a little snow up there right now, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> uh, little known fact, let's see here. Uh, I have two grandchildren. Marketing and Publications Director, and I just started here about a little over a month, month and a half ago. Two months in. I know. I'm, I'm trying to hold on to the one month thing so I can have some excuses. But, you know, um, yeah. Oh, I'm originally from New York City. Woohoo! Another one in the room. Um, little known <laughs> fact, which I thought I would never disclose, I disclosed to Lindsay and Megan. I thought it was kind of funny, but when I was a young girl. I was a catalog model for Texas Instruments. They did not they did not base that on looks. Okay? <laughs> they based that on my very big cheeks and uh, Asian features because it went to a their, their catalog in Korea. And I'm not Korean. So they <laughs> so I'm Megan Keen. I'm the membership director at N10. See, a little known fact about me is that I am a huge fan of penguins. So if you follow me on Twitter, you probably know that. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's becoming less known fact. <laughs> I'm Lindsay. I'm the program director at N10. And let's see, my hometown is Anadarko, Oklahoma, although I currently live in Portland, Oregon. Um, and a little known fact, I was one of three Caucasian girls to graduate from my high, high school class. My hometown is 98% Native American. So I was definitely one of the cheese that stood alone. It was a lot of fun. I ate a lot of fried bread. I love it. It is delicious. It I is. haven't had it in a long time. Um, my name is Molly Brooks Bank. I'm at the Sierra Club. Um, I work for our national office, but I'm based in Austin, Texas. So I'm a remote employee for the Sierra Club. And my uh, position, I'm the director of digital engagement. And uh, I grew up in Oklahoma, too, oh, in really? Tulsa. Um, although my entire family's in Austin now, so I kind of consider myself an Austinite. And my little known fact is that um, my entire childhood, I thought I was going to grow up to be a physicist. And in fact, when I was five years old, I wrote a fan letter to Carl Sagan. And I still nice. remember <laughs> <laughs> writing it with like blue crayon. And that was like a, I was really proud of myself. So anyway, still a big fan of science, but. Cool. That's very cool. Wow. Wow. You people are hard to beat. Um, my name is Katherine Engelhart Kronk, and I wear a couple hats. Former nonprofit executive. I'm currently the founder and CEO of a company called Community Technology or CTK, and we provide software for nonprofits. And I'm the president of a foundation called CTK Foundation, which we started seven years ago, and we give 
about $100,000 away each year to nonprofits, primarily in the Austin area, but once or twice we've spread our wings and gone a little further afield or farther afield. The little known fact about me, oh, I, I wait, I come, I was born in New Jersey, but I went to college in Minnesota and stayed there, and I kind of consider Minneapolis as my home just because I loved it, I love it there. I'm going to end up retiring there in 25 years. Um, little known fact about me, all right, I'm going to go out on the limb and say something I never told anybody, including the people I work with, so I hope they're not listening to this. No. I kind of think the older I get, I'm a little bit psychic. That's something that I've noticed about myself. When I meet people or when I'm in a certain situation, I get sort of notions that tend to be true. But I'm not that kind of person, that kind of new agey person, so I don't tell people that, but I've just told you. Okay. Are you coming to the happy hour later? Because I want to test, I want to test this out. No, 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 that's what you don't want to do. Yeah. Yes, How many fingers am I holding up? No, we're not doing, it's not that. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just. <laughs> That's, uh, well, maybe it's just, you know, intuition, intuition and uh, experience, and you, so you could read people really well, and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> right. We, all kidding aside, we did in the last couple, last two sessions, and this is, you know, sort of echoing what Lindsay was saying, last two sessions we had a couple people, for different reasons, say, hey, can we shut that off for a minute, I want to, I want to say something. And uh, we were all like, "Ooh, what's going? Whoa, hey, what are we gonna hear now?" And uh, we heard some interesting things. So, um, about national candidates of stature that everyone would know, and he told some laundry. And anyway, uh, oh, so my name is Mike Rudin. I work at Black Bod. I'm a change management consultant. My hometown. I was born in Dallas. Uh, moved to Youngstown, Ohio when I was three. I grew up in. Uh, so I call. So Youngstown, Ohio, my hometown, like where my mom still lives there, kind of thing. Uh, but I've lived in Charleston now for 12 years, so it's like, well, maybe, maybe that's my hometown. I don't know. It's my kid's hometown for sure. So you're a hard act to follow. Um, well, uh, did I say this one last time? I won my second grade spelling bee championship. It's gone downhill from there. So, what's that? I couldn't repeat. It was embarrassing. I peaked early, you know. I thought I was hot stuff, and uh, anyway. Uh, I always encourage people to take advantage of the time. As Lindsay said, this is a busy time, and, and thank you for taking uh, and making the investment of time here. Uh, but also, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I know you're very busy. If you need to take calls, or that, that's cool, and, and that's we perfectly understand that. But I also encourage you that if you're here, try to be here, uh, and, um, you know, if people are talking, all that kind of stuff, all that kind of good session stuff and then you know network and have fun we got some things here we'll have lunch there's a happy hour later we'll talk about later if you can make it so there's plenty of opportunity to meet other folks and hopefully make this a valuable time so we will do a session here uh, I like again I'm, I'm a big fan of breaks especially in um, sort of adult learning situations we'll do a little opening session and that's really going to be the only you know sort of presentation of the day so to speak We'll have a break, and then we'll come back. We've got a couple of great panelists here. We're going to talk about a little their experience with uh, change, and we'll sort of have a little panel discussion and have it be interactive. Uh, we've got a couple sort of exercises that will hopefully bring home some of the ideas that we're talking about in terms of where you are and where you want to be. And also, I have a long background in the area of communication and communication theory, so I lean on that a little bit, and I talk about the power of narrative, and we'll actually try to craft some narratives and stuff like that. So we really look at this as, uh, at the end of the day, hopefully something that you could literally walk out of here with some, um, you know, some takeaways here. So we'll do that, audiences and motivators, and we'll take a little break, and then we'll round up uh, sort of bringing it all together at the end, okay? Uh, with the smaller, you know, and we will not go over, a, I'm a big believer in time and keeping on schedule, okay? So the shortcut if we wanted to cut it all down to one slide and then we could leave here at 9.15. Uh, basically, an organization, if you're trying to engage in some kind of change, if you have a plan, if you've got a spirit, a strategy, you think, okay, we're going to do this. Well, you see what I did here? Psych, right? Isn't that slick? That's slick PowerPoint, right? How it popped up there without me touching. 
Do you young kids in the back know what I mean when I say psych? When I was your age, that's what we used to say. I don't know, what would you say now? As if? Is that what? Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> no, the, the sort of dirty little secret, I mean, and, and the assumption is if you were interested in some way in this, in this session, that you had maybe something in mind of either an experience that you had tried to implement some kind of change, whether it was technology related or new leadership or if you're starting off, everything's new. Um, and, and maybe you had a great experience or maybe not. And you probably though, this probably I would hope rings true to you in the sense that you could have all the best intentions and sometimes you, know, you could build it and they won't come kind of thing, right? And so we're gonna try to talk about it. This is what I do in my job. I do change management. I talk to people, I sort of get in and uh, try to understand all the audiences and all the factors and try to help path them. And I'm gonna try to do a little shortcut on that to us. But if you don't mind, again, not to ambush you here, did anyone have um, a specific instance in mind where they were thinking of, you know, I'm going through something right now, I thought this, this session would be helpful or any experiences in the past that you have, good or bad? Um, did you have anything like that that you had in particular that you wanted to maybe reflect upon today? services through my organization. I have to coach clients on change all the time because they're implementing a new system, implementing new business processes, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of sharpening those skills around around that process is always good. And then what about do, do you or anyone else, what have you, do you know any sort of models or theory on change? Or, uh, who, do you remember? Uh, or what? Do you know? for the live stream, Catherine's just saying she's, yeah, she's reading about it all the time, and I do too, and I'm gonna sort of show you about that. Um, some people have heard of John Cotter, sort of a famous, uh, and it's fair to say, seminal work in the field in terms of his eight steps of change management. A lot of people who develop models sort of springboard off of Cotter. It was part of the flipped materials, a little, you know, uh, tutorial on John Cotter, which is very valuable. I. I you know, he has a new sort of model going out now, it's called Accelerate, that is trying to sort of update his old model, but um, it's not as well known. Anyone else going through a particular change or experience with it you wanna share? Jason, yeah. yeah. Um, at, our at our foundation, um, we're kind of almost by accident, but intentional at the same time. Uh, switching from a lot of stuff that used to be manually or paper-based into uh, mobile technologies. So we are finding, I bought a, s uh, a set of iPads that we had one particular use for, for uh, board and committee meetings, and now they're starting to be used for events, um, starting to be used for just things that I never even thought our staff, like my teammates, would even use them for. And so now it's starting to educate them about other issues, um, data management and security and all these other things that um, just kind of happen to come about. It happens a lot with technology. A lot of people talk about sort of a, a you know, a, a two-step uh, implementation of technology. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of a change management uh, curve, if you want to call it that. But, um, you know, technology is an interesting one because you have maybe one intention that you want to say and, and then it becomes sort of this organic process of people say, oh, well, we could do it this way, right? I mean, it's like literally going back to the beginning of the internet, right? Uh, you know, you have this situation where you have government and educational institutions 45 years ago, you know, talking about uh, sharing data, right? And, you know, one of the big things that came out of that, one of those sort of accidental kind of things, they didn't really intend it, they also set up this thing that they could talk to each other, which basically was the beginning of email. And the researchers at the government and educational institutions loved it. And they, you know, that was all the way down at the bottom of the list. They didn't really think that that was gonna be the key thing and it ended up being the key thing. So sometimes these accidental discoveries in change that you didn't intend are, you know, complicated and sometimes wonderful and sometimes crazy. Anyone else wanna share one? Go ahead.
four or five years ago when I first moved to Oregon, there was a, a kind of LinkedIn open and Twitter open and then there was Facebook open and then there was just Google and then, I mean, I've always searched on Google things, but what happened is a lot of people said, where did you find these things on social media? I actually wrote a blog post on my Kindle blog about that that said, you know, you are gone. You are out of it. If you are not checking LinkedIn and checking Facebook and seeing who's posting and what's most current and uh, what that foundation, and it's the donors are gone now. I guess they they kind of accepted that I wasn't that big of an issue. It's a big change in the networking, and of course a lot of the grantor pages are online and it's just growing and growing and growing. And a lot of people are into grant professional association, and some of these really well-respected support groups, um, they're still very traditional, and they don't want to, they're kind of afraid to try that new thing. So I guess I would just say, I'm in there, I'm swimming in the deep end, but how do we bring the rest of the sector along because they're kind of afraid to come out? Well, and it's funny, what, what some of us take for granted is still science fiction to some people. I, I was talking to someone who did, they just hired someone uh, about three months ago, and it wasn't a black bottle, it was a friend of mine. I said, well, what did you, did you Google them? They're like, well, no, I didn't think of doing that. I'm like, <laughs> I said, so I was, we were sitting there and I, I opened up and I said, well, let me see. And I just looked at their name and here's their LinkedIn profile and here's where they used to work. And she's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. That you, I'm like, oh, come on now, you know, you have to do it. So, um, go ahead. I was going to add that we think maybe it's the older generations that are not accepting the technology, but actually I was just talking to somebody who's very fluent in tech and who's been doing social and business administration for a little bit. And so. I've, it's all ages that need educating, and the young ones come out and they seem to want to use those tools as well. So, one hundred percent agree with that. Um, yes, can we, you introduce yourself? We're using this microphone; it's not projecting; it's for uh, live stream stuff. We are saying name, hometown, and a little-known fact. Oh, and who? Where do you work? Statesman Volunteer of the Year two years ago, or nominated. So that's a good one. That's a good one. Thanks, Ken. Welcome. I'm going to jot down your name here just so I uh, have my little map. Okay, so thank you, and we'll keep talking about this. And I couldn't agree more that it's not necessarily. I mean, you assume it's generational, and the 22-year-olds are all hip. But uh, yeah, I, I used to. Um, have a lot of experience with that, and you think, oh, well, yeah, yeah, the absent-minded professional, yeah. Okay, so we're going to hit a lot of these, and hopefully, like I said, I, I really hope this is a conversation. I have to feel like a little bit like Phil Donahue with this, uh, the run over here. Do you, you guys in the back know who Phil Donahue is? Kirby, you ever heard of Phil Donahue? Olivia, no? Google him sometime. You'll, you'll get the joke. <laughs> He's got it, you know? I'm starting to get his gray hair. That's the thing. He's from Cleveland. He's from Lakewood. Uh, so some of you may have seen some of these models before. This Cotter's model is one that was in the sort of, uh, you know, the flipped materials or whatever. And this is, we'll, we'll come back to this. This isn't going to, this isn't intended for us to sort of linger on. But you may have seen John Cotter's eight-step change model. Some of you may have seen sort of the Prosky sort of famous at change management where you have five levels here and you have this element of um, you know what's going on at each level here multiple projects is it absent and sort of moving up the level some of you may have heard of this Prosky thing maturity grid we're actually going to do a maturity grid a little bit more specific to technology today uh, a little bit later some of you may have heard of ADCAR has anyone heard of ADCAR or seen it it's one of these you sort of see, sort of like Catherine was saying, you, you read stuff and, you know, maybe you don't digest it. You know, awareness, desire, knowledge, ability, and reinforcement, which is a very reasonable model, right? You want to give people awareness. We'll talk about this awareness. Uh, there's this sort of triangle one that's sort of based on Prosky. Uh, you've got leadership, project change, 
uh, which makes sense to me in its sort of three tenets. You've got this change acceleration process model. This is where this was used at uh, GE has used this, which is you know sort of going along here from a current state to an improved state. I like the you know transition and sort of the uh, movement here, but it's not necessarily different. The guy who works a lot in logistics, he said, look, all models are wrong, some are useful. And I love that quote. This is one I stole from actually someone from the San Francisco master class. She said, look, you know, these all may make sense. They may mean something to you, and maybe you take a nugget of each of them, and they could be useful and thoughtful. And I, I just love this because in this day and age, you do. You read a ton. If you're on Twitter, it's like you, you could just uh, – it's great, and then it's also – I'm sure I'm not the only one who now is like, I read it somewhere, right? Like you forget where you read things because it's coming to you from so many different um, outlets. So what did I try to do? Well, I tried to put together my own model, you know, of course. Uh, and this, I wouldn't call it a model. It's just sort of things that I think are important when you start talking about change. I'm a big believer that leadership communication and involvement are the three major gears. And this is very reflective of other people's models. This is not anything 100% unique, but it also happens in an environment we'll talk about a little bit. You know, the culture of your organization, right? Your organization starting up is going to be completely different than one that's 30 years, uh, you know, mature, right? And so how does that affect how things are processed? Everything's new at a new organization. Some of you may work in an organization that has a few people. We had a guy in San Francisco, it was him and one other guy, right, the, say the frogs, and, and then he had some part-timers coming in and out. He's like, everything's new to me. And then we had some people who work at big organizations. So the culture of the organization has to be taken into uh, account. Are there pods or sort of nodes in an organization? This idea of human nature we'll talk about. Who are the stakeholders? It's not just the employees or the people implementing the change. It can be shareholders. It could be donors. It could be people affected with your, by your organization. There's a lot of people to consider in terms of that. What are the politics? So all these things are sort of swimming around in this tub that you have to think about, and as Ken probably can attest, it's a lot of these factors you can't anticipate, and um, you think it's going to be easy, and it's going to be, oh, this is great, we're going to do this great, it's, everyone wins, well, I don't win, right, you want to change one thing, this is going to be easier, you know, you can take your notes on an iPad, I don't want to, right, that's not easier for me, right, you institute a new CRM, and you think, oh my God, this is going to transform our organization, and you have the person who's maybe two years away from retirement saying, the only thing I'm hearing is that I have to learn a new system now, and that stinks, right? So you have a lot of different sort of factors and audiences, and we'll talk about that today. Cool? Is everyone cool? Okay. I'm looking at my phone. I'm not checking the text. I just want to shut my phone off. I have a watch, so I took it off. So, like I said, the culture is now... I think an important factor, I think people are a little bit more tuned into culture than they were maybe five or ten years ago. You didn't hear people talking about it as much. Now you people sort of have a recognition that you know, there is a certain vibe of this office or this culture of this community or even you know, larger um, sort of uh, you know, nationally and worldwide culture of change and technology. Um, it is hard though, right? This is the one I like to remind people. Change you know, they say the old adage is no one likes change except for a baby with a dirty diaper, right? And they don't like it either. You're right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Neither do the parents. My brother has uh, triplets. I have twins. You know, as a father of twins, I couldn't imagine having triplets. But so he, he, he you have, you have tri twins? Okay. He has triplets who are about a, a year and a half old, right? So... When you think about that, they're just getting, you know, you, you walk into a room and you don't know where they are. Anyway, so he texts uh, me and my siblings the other day, and he said, hey, what did y'all do when your kids started climbing out of your crib? <laughs> He's like, because Will, Will's like the big one. He climbed out of his crib, opened the door, and like walked into their bedroom, you know, and they're like, uh, this is not good. And <laughs> so we're like, oh, do this or do that. And uh, so the next day he texted us and said, well, the good news is, get out of the crib, but the bad news is, you know, he took off his diaper and went to the bathroom. Anyway. <laughs> Three of them. So, he didn't like dirty diapers either. Uh, mentally tiring, stressful, enthusiasm is not commitment. This is 
one of the things I work a lot on. We'll talk about, some people are familiar with sort of, it takes a while to get from here to there, but usually when you get to here, there's another dip, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit. This mentally tiring, have you traveled internationally? I'm sure a lot of people have. It's, it's, a, little, it's, it's a little bit of a wear, isn't it? I mean, everything is new and different. You have to think about, you want to go buy a bottle of water. First of all, you have to find out, you know, some people, they don't have 7-Elevens, right? You have to find the place to buy it. Then you have to go and you pull out your money and you look at the money and then you sort of like humbly just sort of offer the person the money like, please count this for me. I don't know what I'm doing here, right? And I mean, things that you take for granted, right? It's like, it's like driving home. How many times have you driven home and you pulled in your driveway and you're like, I don't remember a minute of that last 20 minutes, right? You're on autopilot. But it's, if there's an accident on the way home and you have to take a different route and you have to figure it out and you're checking Google Maps or whatever you do, I mean, that's more of a stress. And so any change stresses the brain, literally stresses the brain. And sometimes, even if it's perfectly obvious to us why this is a great idea that's going to benefit the, the person and the individual and the organization, sometimes it's just hard. It really is just hard, okay? So don't forget about the culture and what's going on. The idea behind any change is you want to improve what's going on. I mean, otherwise, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't undertake a change. What a lot of people, I think, are pretty familiar with is that generally, to get from one area to another, you do have a dip, usually, right? It takes some time to ramp up, to learn the new technology, to get used to the new leader, whatever it is. Some people have associated this with, like, a grief curve. And, you know, people sort of chuckle at that. But... There's some truth here. And if you've gone through a change, maybe a major leadership change, a new technology in your organization, you know, sometimes you just, you don't believe it's coming. You sort of ignore the emails that we're going to go to a new system to bill our time. It's like, okay, whatever, tell me later. You're literally in denial. And then it's like, why do they do this? You know, I mean, this was hard, but I knew it. I talk about at BlackBot, we changed over recently to do a new system to bill our time. And the old system I thought was, uh, antiquated and took me 20 steps when I thought it should take me two, right? But you know what? I knew it. And I knew how to do it on Friday afternoon or whenever I did my time or whenever, right? And so there was this, I know the new way is going to be better, but I'm right here where it's like I'm still learning it, you know? And it still takes me more time than I think it should to enter in what I did this week, right? So the idea behind any kind of change management is that you're trying to you know, decrease the dip, right? You're trying to sort of shallow out that dip. And I will tell you, not to be too dramatic, that just by being in this room, you are ahead of about 95% of the people out there who don't think about this, who think that, hey, we're going to get iPads for everyone, and it's going to be great. And they don't think that there is going to be this dip. And it's going to take a while before that change, like I said, whether it's technology or leadership or whatever, pays off. You know, you, people talk about return on investment. Of course, they want to, you know, what's the ROI, blah, blah, blah. Well, then it's going to take a little time. The dirty little secret is there's usually a little dip after even that, right? After sort of go live is not the end, is not the finish line. Some people who work in technology will vigorously shake their head at that. They go live, like, hey, and then it's like, ugh, you know, what happened? Okay. So, I'm a big believer that, you know, like I said, literally just by being here, I think you're ahead of the game, okay? Uh, you'll see me focus today on three things, the leadership, communication, and involvement, and this idea that you need to define what you're doing. Sometimes people buy technology or, or in try to make some kind of fundamental process change or leadership change without, I don't think, understanding or even really thinking about what's going on here, right? And what do you really want to get out of it? And then also, who's leading this thing, right? Does anyone have ownership over it? We were at a talk, the professional services conference here in Austin, where the guy said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the definition of leader. If you look over your shoulder and there's someone behind you, you are a leader, right? If you have people sort of following in your wake, you are leading your organization, whether it's true on the organizational chart or not. And so if you are instituting the new technology or you're, you're the one to come up with the idea, usually people are, oh, okay, I'll see where, where this goes, and they'll follow along. And so there is some responsibility to doing that, okay? 
when we talk about the culture, I think about, you know, what is the culture of the organization? Is it sort of a hip, you know, techie kind of culture? Or as Carolyn was alluding, you know, is it a place where people aren't really tuned into sort of what we would consider basic, what ABCs of new technology? At the end of the day, I'm a big believer in starting at the end, okay? What, what's the end goal here? I, I'm working with a client now who, you know, I'm not going to disclose anything, but I don't think they really know why they bought the thing that they bought. And so I'm going back there in a couple weeks, and it's going to be like, it's going to be a hard conversation. I'm, you know, I had this conversation. I was like, so why did you buy this? And I'm not going to tell you the product. 